which people will use for small to medium sized molecules and of course for large molecules but even for small to medium sized molecules for various purposes and i would first say what are the purposes for which the quantum chemists use not just dft but any kind of theory i see that now recording has started am i right Yes. Now I, it's recording. Yeah, now recording it's recording. started. Yeah. So with this uh, brief introduction to the course, that the course is primarily meant to the experimentalists. So the apology to theoreticians who are expecting any kind of vigor. Uh, that say I am not going to do this. The course will run over today, tomorrow, of course, and might run over the next weekend. It's quite likely that I will not be finishing even tomorrow. I do not want to go very fast for obvious reasons, but I don't. I want you people to understand a little bit, particularly the students. If you understand a little bit about the basis set, what is the functional, when do, when do you use DFT, and so on, I think I'll be very happy. So with that uh, introduction, I will now start. I will. I am using iPad. I'm using a pad, so I'm going to share the screen, and I'm going to write in the pencil. So please let me know if that works. Uh, uh, this is a problem. Uh, you have to give me permission to share. Ashini. Hello. So I have to give a permission to share to you. Yeah, otherwise I cannot share. It says that the only host can share. Oh, so let, you, let me make if you, you host, host, I can. I, yeah, yeah. Me, yeah, 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 yeah. One of the other thing. Yeah, you yeah. can make me host, whichever way. Otherwise, I can't share. I think this is something that probably I didn't tell yeah. Suman. Uh, because this is, but even in uh, even in laptop, if you share PowerPoint presentation in Zoom, you require the permission. In Google Meet, when we are doing within ISA Kolkata, everybody can share. Yeah, yeah. But in Zoom, that is probably not possible. Are you able to do it? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Sure. I have put my glasses somewhere, so it's a thing. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I see some of the chat boxes where people are, yeah. Yes. Now let us see if we can do it. Okay. Share screen photo. Yes. Okay. So I'll start the broadcast and just let me know. So that's the problem with online teaching. Are you able to see? Yeah. Okay, great. That's the first success. I think. <laughs> the reason I'm saying is that I normally am teaching Google Meet. So in Zoom, I actually attend meetings. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So I think uh, I'm able to see. Uh, I hope you are able to see my writing also in the pencil. Yeah, yeah. It's visible. Oh, yeah, great. You can see. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So so this introduction to DFT and and, and today is sixth uh, of March. Yeah, so I think, first of all, of course, there are several methods of quantum chemistry. And DFT is one of the important class of method, as I told you, which I'm going to talk about. And today's class will be very easy. So I think you did not worry. I'll come to more grassroots from tomorrow. And then, of course, the next one or two classes. I think it will take overall three to four classes to finish this, what I want to do. So I hope all of you, first of all, know what do we do in quantum chemistry? And, and this I'm addressing particularly to the experimentalists. So why is quantum chemistry today so popular to the experimentalists? So 
So there are several things that you can do. So one of the first thing is, of course, to calculate the energies. I mean, that is trivial to say the energies of a molecule of any system. And, and usually we do under the fixed nuclei. So if it's, a mole, if it's a molecule, then the fixed nuclei, which is basically the bond oppenheimer approximation. But let me also tell you that is this, this is the most common energy calculation, which you basically call a single point calculation. But one can go beyond and look at non-bond Oppenheimer approximations, which you are, of course, not going to worry about it. But it is possible to look at the curve crossing where two potential energies cross and so on. We not only look at the energy of a system at a particular geometry, but we can keep changing the geometry. And for each geometry, we can calculate energy and eventually get what is called the potential energy surface. So this is a very, very important thing uh, that, that, the, that the experimentalists always need. So let me give an example of a potential energy surface uh, within the bond oppenheimer approximation, of course. So for example, if I have a simple molecule like hydrogen, okay, so then you have, this is the distance between the hydrogen and hydrogen. I calculate the energy and I will qualify that energy. It is called the potential energy. It actually goes at R equal to zero. This is R equal to zero. It goes very, very high. It goes very high, okay? So it actually goes towards infinity. As you come down, it actually crosses a line and I will explain that line a little bit and then eventually turns here. And this line is the energy of the two hydrogen atoms, which are separated. So that is why I'm calling it H plus H, because you know, in the gas phase, this is of course a gas phase calculation. If I keep the distance very, very large, it essentially means that the hydrogen molecule is dissociated. And I have reached a situation where hydrogen molecule has become two hydrogen atoms. So at R equal to infinity, it will asymptotically, or asymptotically, if you don't understand the meaning of asymptotically, it means it is slowly going to approach the hydrogen plus hydrogen energy. So this is not a zero, this is the hydrogen plus hydrogen. But at some point, this energy will go below the hydrogen plus hydrogen, and this is the point where you can say that the hydrogen molecule is the most stable in the gas phase. So we can call it equilibrium distance. So this is something that all of you know. So what I'm trying to say that in the quantum chemistry, we can, we can calculate energy of a system at any point. And hence, I can calculate the energy of a system over the entire point and get the potential energy surface. And thus, we can predict the the geometry of the molecule. We normally are very efficient in calculating the geometries for what I call the ground state. So that cell is a ground state of the hydrogen molecule. Though I can calculate similar potential surface for states which are not ground state, which means excited states and so on. As all of you know already, that the molecules have several states, quantum mechanically. So they are called ground, excited states, and so on. And the spectroscopy is used to trap them. And there are a lot of ways you can generate. So I'm com I'll come to that a little later. So usually when I'm talking of this surface, uh, we are very good in calculating ground state surface. For the excited state, it is not so easy, but it can be done. So these are two very, very important parts that this, what I call single, you might have heard this nomenclature, single point energy. This is single point energy. Then you might have heard geometry optimization. So this is called the geometry optimization. I can actually get geometry optimization is somewhat easier, but I can get a full potential energy surface and, and actually know where the optimum energy lies. So the equilibrium distance I can find out. And that's, that is, something that the uh, chemist would like. Although I, I, must, I must say, although I explained this with a very simple molecule like hydrogen, you can do this for 
a larger system where all possible coordinates or bond length, bond angle, dihedral angles can be changed. And eventually you can reach a, 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 a set of parameters, set of coordinates for which the energy is minimum. So they are, they will be most complicated potential energy surface. This is a single dimension, there will be multi-dimensional surface, but eventually a surface can be obtained and you can trap the optimization of the optimum structure. Without doing this, we can also get the optimization. And that is something that has happened because of what are called gradient and Hessian optimization. So optimization of a geometry is a very important part. So what I want to tell that to trap this point, very often you don't need the entire surface. So things are simpler. You should be able to calculate this point of what is called the minimum of the energy surface uh, by some other means. But trust me, it's a very complex subject. And, and it can so happen that it might be very, very difficult often to calculate the minimum, global minimum, what is called the absolute minimum. In this case, there is only one minimum, but there are multidimensional surfaces where there are many, many minimum. Some of them we call local, some of them we can global. So absolute minimum is not very easy to tra trap very often, but it is possible to trap and many, many of the programs today are doing it. So very effortlessly in Gaussian, for example, you optimize geometry, okay? So again, we are, I'm not even telling how do you do DFT, nothing at this point. I'm only saying the scope of quantum chemistry. What can it do? Quantum chemistry can also calculate the energy difference of all kinds. That means the differences between two energies they can be spectroscopic energy differences like ground and excited states, different between excited and excited states and so on. This can be electronic, vibrational, rotational and so on. So all kinds of spectroscopic energy you can actually calculate. And, and that, is, that is very good because we want to do the spectroscopy. We can of course have other kinds of energy differences. So for example, interaction energy between two molecules or two systems. That is something that again you can do. So for example, if I have a system A and a system B and they interact to give you A, B, then you can calculate the difference of this energy and the difference of these two energies separately, subtract, you get the interaction. So if you want to make the interaction energy positive, then I will define the interaction energy as Ea, energy of A, plus energy of B, minus energy of AB. So if this is positive, that means this AB is stable. What do you mean by stable? The energy of AB is lower than the energy of A and B. So just as here, A is hydrogen, B is another hydrogen. Energy of H2 is lower than the hydrogen plus hydrogen. And I can call this is the interaction energy between the two hydrogen atoms, except that we never call this interaction energy. We have a simple term which is called dissociation energy of the hydrogen molecule or the, or the energy to form the bond between the two hydrogen atoms. But in general, if I have a molecule A and a molecule B, they can interact. So this makes it the interaction energy. Please note in many textbooks, the interaction energy is defined as exactly reverse. This becomes plus, these two become minus. But I normally do not like this because when you ask what is the interaction energy, you don't say negative term. If it is stable, you call it a positive value. So to make it positive, you should actually define this as A plus B minus AB so that if this is lower than A plus B, the result will be positive, okay? So we can calculate interaction energy. Uh, very similar thing is called the binding energy of the two systems. And in fact, there's a class of interaction energy. You can call it hydrogen bond, energy of the hydrogen bond and all kinds of things. Weak interaction, strong interaction, it doesn't matter what is the system. If I am very good, if I know how to calculate these things very, very accurately, I should be able to nail them down. So that is another very important part of uh, the this the the uh, quantum chemistry quantum chemistry 
can calculate the difference energy, Sol spectroscopy, excitation energy, ionization potential, electron affinity. So many of these all come under the difference of energies. You can also calculate the properties. And this is something that we can say what properties, for example, just give an example, dipole moment of a molecule. I can calculate polarizability. You can calculate hyperpolarizability, magnetic susceptibility. Okay, and then you can even do NMR. Uh, so all NMR parameters, shift and so on. So I think it's, it's, it's a very, very potent. In fact, most of the spectroscopy that you do are all amenable to calculations. And in many ways or other, the quantum mechanics and in specifically quantum chemistry comes into use. If you look at the most of the content of the energy calculation, apart from the single point energy, which is actually not very useful. What is useful is of course the surface and the optimum geometry or the energy differences. You see, after all, everything is energy differences. If you look at the calculation of this point, it's also energy difference. Because when you say this is minimum, it is minimum with respect to other points. That means you can say that the energy of this point is lower than all other energies. So if you look at the chemistry, most of the time you are talking of energy difference of this kind. And this is where the problem comes. So let us assume this particular reaction, some A plus B going to AB, it can be nitrogen to three hydrogen going to two ammonia, whatever. The the, these by themselves are very, very large values. In fact, how large you should be able to have some ballpark number. Like for example, hydrogen, I hope all of you know hydrogen atom has a half, minus half atomic unit energy, the ground state, 1s hydrogen atom, which translates to 13 point, minus 13.6 electron volt. Minus essentially means that it is bound. I mean, you have to give actually, electron is bound. You have to give energy of exactly the same amount, positive, to make it ionized. Okay. So if hydrogen atom has minus 13.6 electron volt, you should be able to calculate roughly what is the energy of ammonia, water, and so on. And you will quickly see how, how quickly these things jump. So for example, if you do a water calculation, in atomic unit, which is hydrogen, it's half, it will be of the order of 76. Again, I'm just giving a ballpark numbers. It will be almost 76. If you do ammonia, it will be maybe 100 something. If you do methane, 120, whatever. So I will not be able to give the exact numbers, but I'm just trying to tell you. So the same number is goes to 76 atomic unit of energy. It's very, very large. Whereas hydrogen atom is, so this is all minus, uh, is a half atomic unit. So these numbers are very, very scary. It's a large number. So this is a very large number. This is a very large number. This is also a very large number, of course. But when you calculate the interaction energy, you will very often find the interaction energies are very, very small. So for example, if you are doing a hydrogen bond, or let's say water dimer, so H2O and H2O, what is the interaction energy of this? So if you start to calculate, they will be of the order of kilocalorie per mole, a few kilojoules per mole. Now imagine, and this is where units are very, very important, atomic units. So you are looking at two calculations, which are of the order of 76 atomic units. And then you are looking at a high water timer, and now you're subtracting this with this and this. That's your A plus B minus AB, right? So your AB is water dimer. And each of them is 76. So this will be probably 152, 153 atomic units, at least twice or more. Of course, if it is exactly twice, there is no interaction. So when I say they interact water dimer, what does it mean? 
the energy will be slightly less than twice of the water molecule. But they are very, very large. If there is a small error, so if 76 becomes 75, let's say, and let's say I have a 153 some number, which becomes 153.5, let's say. By absolute scale, it's a very, very small difference. But when I take a difference, it's going to become a huge. In fact, these numbers are out of scale. If you take a difference here, interaction energy will already be one atomic unit, which is wrong. Because the water dimer is much less. But if you do it here, 150, it will become 3.5. It's much worse. The point that I'm trying to say is that because I'm, my interaction energies are very small numbers arising out of a difference of two large numbers, we have to be extremely accurate in calculation. So all the calculation of energy requires high accuracy, such that the differences are of the order of kilojoules, which are called chemical accuracy today. And this is the singular challenge of quantum chemistry, to find such an accuracy. Accuracy, which is matched by experiment. Accuracy, which is demanded by the experiment. And this is a singular challenge, and that has kept the quantum chemistry going. Okay, and that is the most important part that I first want to tell. So to do this energy calculation in conventional quantum chemistry, as many of you already know, we solve what is called the Schrodinger equation. And again, I will not go into the theory as I promised of quantum mechanics, how this arises out of quantum mechanics, but I should say there are two kinds of Schrodinger equation. There's a time dependent and a time independent. A conventional Schrodinger equation is a time independent Schrodinger equation, where for every system like A, B, A, B, water, water dimer, whatever, there is a Hamiltonian. And then we solve an equation, which is often known as the eigenvalue equation of this. Hamiltonian operator. Which is so many conferences, the logo of the conference actually is H psi equal to E psi. So we want to solve this psi for the given Hamiltonian and the energy. So if I solve for the ground state, this becomes a ground state energy. So it's important to notice that for the same Hamiltonian, I have many solutions. So I call this, I will be using mathematics as less as possible, but live just a bit. So I call this with a subscript I, it denotes different states. So for a given Hamiltonian, I have states of systems which are denoted by psi. And then it says that the mod psi square is the probability density. And this is where quantum mechanics comes in. Because the quantum mechanics says that there is only a probability and that comes through the wave function psi. And this is what is called the eigenvalue and that is called the energy. There are many EIs. The lowest of them is, of course, the ground state energy, then the first excited state, and so on. The point that I'm trying to say is that this number has to be calculated very, very accurately. Right? And this is the singular challenge of quantum chemistry, that can we calculate this number as accurately as possible? How accurately, again, will be determined by a problem. So in this kind of problems, we want of the orders of kilojoules per mole. Now, kilojoules per mole is a hugely small, considering that the energy of the water molecule will be of the order of 76 points some atomic unit. I hope all of you know how translation of units happen. So one atomic unit, I hope all of you know, is the order of 27 point, just like half atomic unit, 13.65. So it's about 27 
5.216, etc. Electron volt. And then one electron volt is of the order of 23 kilocalorie per mole. And then that translates into 4.2 kilojoules. I hope all of you remember this simple formula. So you can imagine one atomic unit has a translation which is more than 1,000 kilojoules. So you are talking of 76,000 kilojoules. When you're talking of 70,000 atomic unit, and you have to make a difference such that the difference comes at two, three, four kilojoules per mole. I hope you realize how difficult it is. So this is a singular challenge to be that accurate. So I just, it's very important to understand the units, otherwise you'll never appreciate why these guys who are quantum chemists are so keen in getting all these decimals. So to us, if you say, water has 76.1 atomic unit, I'm not happy. Is it one, 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 two, really one, zero? That is also very important. Because as I told you, one atomic unit is 1,000 kilojoules. Even if you're making 0 0.01 atomic unit, it's about 10 kilojoules. So you can imagine that why do the quantum chemists fight for numbers and accuracies? Many, many of the experimentalists do not understand and they often snuff at that. That what are they doing? They're wasting their time. In fact, many physicists also do not understand because in physics, Understanding a phenomenon qualitatively is good enough. But in chemistry, unfortunately, we are always looking at binding energy. And hence, the digits are, are very, very important when you transfer them in the atomic unit. So I, I think with that, I just want to say that usually this is what has to be solved very accurately. Given a system, the Hamiltonian is an operator that can be written. I will not worry about it, but it has a kinetic energy. It has a potential energy. They can be written using quantum mechanics and then an operator eigenvalue equation can be solved. Uh, this is very famously called the second order differential equation for the Schrodinger equation. But the important point that I want to say is that this Hamiltonian has many coordinates, how many? For each, if I write for the electrons and assuming that the nu nuclei are fixed in born oppenheimer so if I have an N electron problem, then the Hamiltonian has coordinates, which are three N coordinates. I hope it's clear to all of you because every electron has three coordinates. So, so if this Hamiltonian for N electron has three coordinates, for an n electron system. And the wave function will also have those three, three n coordinates. And in addition, the wave function has a spin, which I am not considering in the Hamiltonian because we are considering what is called the non relative histic picture in which spin does not come in. But the wave function has a spin. So the wave function has, has actually four n coordinates. I hope it's clear that uh, for n electrons, you have x, y, z, r, theta, phi, whatever. And then uh, 3n plus each electron has a spin coordinate, alpha or beta, up spin or down spin. So that makes it 4n coordinates. So you can very easily see that the dimension of the problem becomes very large as you go to larger and larger systems. So I mean, imagine a protein. I mean, it's almost impossible to solve this equation. If you are solving hydrogen atom, it's very easy. If you do helium atom, it's also fairly easy. It's only two electrons, but it, it really blows up exponentially. The enormity of the problem goes up exponentially. And that makes it very difficult to do the calculation. And, and very often, the computational time simply blows up. 
So while there has been tremendous success in solving the Schrodinger equation for a few electron systems, and I must first tell you that even for two electron systems, this solution is not possible to obtain exactly. So exact solution for this Schrodinger equation is not possible even for two electron particles. So what the quantum chemists do is of course to resort to approximations. So we look at approximate solutions and I will without going into the details I will say there are several approximate solutions which are in the literature. So, Paul, so Swita has some questions. So you can, if you want, you can respond. Yeah, your... yeah, yeah. I'm not able to see the chat box because I'm on the screen. Yeah, so you can, you can, you can. Uh, Should I read me. it? Yeah. Yes, uh, she, she, can, she can ask if it's possible. So, so Swita, you ask, please ask the question. So, Swita, are you there? Uh, yes, yeah, please tell us. Professor Paul, yes. I miss being, I, I was uh, listening to your talk and uh, my student mind uh, is wondering, and uh, I have a naive question that why oh, does a chemist good. always envisage for a never ending accuracy level when mother nature, nature herself exploits fluctuation of energy to make a state change? Yes, and but the, the fluctuation, fluctuation as a response we call specific heat, yeah, right? Yeah. So the fluctuation is in a very small energies. That's what I'm trying to say. They're looking at kilojoules. Sure. And 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 uh, and and to obtain that kilojoule accuracy, we are we are not uh, playing with the digits all around. No, that's not a correct thing. Yes. Yes. We, we exactly. don't we don't we don't want to be correct uh, for the water molecule ten digits in atomic unit. No. So there is something called meaningful accuracy. Meaningful accuracy, exactly. Yeah, the unfortunately, that, the, meaningful accu yeah, the meaningful accuracy goes beyond simply saying 76 atomic units. It has to go at least to two or three digits. So typically- GFT also has approximations. Yes, we'll, I'll come to that. I will come to yes. that. I will come Thank to you, that. Thank you, Professor. So, yes. so you, are, you are saying, why do you do DFT? All right, that I'll come to that. Yeah, I, I'm trying to stay, set the stage. stage. Uh, and that's exactly what I'm going to do this class. Why do I do DFT? Okay, so that is the first thing. But of quite, let me let me first say what is the problem of solving a psi equal to e psi where there is a psi, and I just now explained psi has many coordinates, and uh, even for two electron, this is not possible. Solution is not possible to obtain exactly. So you use approximate solutions. Uh, Susmita, are you uh, are you done, or you have some more question? No, I'm I'm oh, done. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, I, I will look forward. Yeah. I'm looking forward yeah, yeah, to you yeah, yeah. more. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, I'm sure you yeah. will. He Thank will, you. He will, he will grill me, I'm sure. Thank yeah. you. I'm uh, learning from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, no. <laughs> so Thank we you. have approximate solutions. And one of the simplest approximations for solving A psi equal to E psi is what is called the Hartree Fock approximation. Again, without going into the details, many of you have heard about the Hartree Fock approximation. Hartree and Fock did this. Uh, the wave function, and of course, the wave function was a what is called the Slater determinant, a single Slater determinant. Determinant essentially uh, brings the right symmetry of the wave function, which is basically the anti-symmetry. Again, I'm not going into the detail. That's why they are called fermions. Both particles are symmetry. Fermions are anti-symmetric. They all come from the quantum indistinguishably, okay, of the Hamiltonian. Again, those are parts of quantum mechanics. So the Hartree Fock is something which is the simplest. But then, unfortunately, it is not good enough. This is easy to do. And you will realize it is probably easier or at least as easy as any DFT. But the problem is that it is not good enough. The error, error that you have in the Hartree Fock is pretty bad. So for example, if I go back to my water molecule, Let's say my actual experimental or actual exact result 
76.212. Let's say I'm just giving a number of a system. I don't know, atomic unit. The Hartree-Fock may give me a number which is 75.9 something. Now, it's not bad. But in the context of what I have been telling you, this is terrible. An error of 0.3 atomic unit is just not acceptable. So the Hartree-Fock recovers the total energy very often 97 to 98% of the total energy, of the exact energy. Well, exact quote and unquote, whatever is exact. But the 2% error is not acceptable because of the reasons that I explained. These are 2%, a very large number, and these are used to calculate difference energies, which are very small, much smaller than this 2%. So the Hartree-Fock, despite the sim simplicity, despite very quick calculation, which is possible today, is just not good enough. That's unfortunate. You even qualitatively miss certain features in the Hartree-Fock. The second point that I want to say that even within the Hartree-Fock, there are grades of approximations. The Hartree-Fock, which is actually the best Hartree-Fock, has what is called the, ex the, the limiting basis set. Because everything in quantum mechanics, as you know, will be done in the basis set. And that I will explain. So depending on which basis set you use, you have different Hartree-Fock. So even within Hartree-Fock, Basis sets can, errors can make results very, look very bad. So basis set problem is there everywhere. So I'm now only looking at the methods, but each method can suffer from basis set. Given that, I would say that now we know how to improve it. And that is where we use something called perturbation theory. That is very, very popular. And a very popular method in that genre is called MP2, second order perturbation. Many of you have already heard MP2. In Gaussian, it's a very popular method. And you can go do MP3, MP4, and so on. Uh, suffice it to say that within the perturbation, MP2 is the cheapest, is the quickest, and gives you reasonably good result. And very often, what is missing in the Hartree Fog, this 2% of the total energy, about 60% of that is recovered in the MP2. So I hope you understand what I mean. MP2 still has an error. It improves the energy, but 60% of 2%. So it's basically about 1.2% it improves. So you still are left with about 0.7, error, which is again, not good. Still not good. I mean, okay, better than Hartree Fock. So you can imagine why we are, Splitting hairs, as Susmita asked, why, are you, why do you split hairs in quantum chemistry? And why don't we let the nature take care? Unfortunately, we are solving a, a Schrodinger equation uh, from quantum mechanics. So obviously, we have to manually make sure that the approximations are that accurate. So of course, you can do MP2, MP3, and so on. I can make it more and more accurate. And of course, as we also must say, as we go down here, it becomes more and more costly. So of course here costly means not like the cost in chemicals are consumable in experiment. Here it simply means computer time is going to be more. So similarly from MP2 to MP3 to MP4, so you can make it better and better, but it is becoming more and more expensive. Then we have of further methods which are called configuration interaction. Very often they are called CI. Again, I will not going to worry about this because this is not the subject matter. So configuration interaction and it is called CI. So again, there are grades of CI. And of course, for each of them, there is basis sets and so on. You have several methods. In fact, the entire quantum chemistry in last 70, 80, 90 years actually, have been full of developing approximations. You know, if this A cycle to E cycle could have been solved exactly, there is nothing to do for the quantum chemists. Well, unfortunately, this statement is very, very important. That more than one electron problem, we cannot solve it exactly. And that is where the approximations come in. 
So, so one of the most glorified approximations is what, sorry. something else, is what is called the couple cluster theory. So this is a very glorified approximation because this can this can actually take care of the accuracy even better than perturbation and configuration interaction and actually today it say it they say that you can get what is called the chemical accuracy in couple cluster. So very, very accurate result for the same water molecule. So you can actually do a water molecule calculation. You will see this is almost close to the exact result. And, and, and any difference energy that you want to now calculate are reliable. Because you are, we are almost reaching chemical accuracy. And that is the reason the, 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 the couple cluster has become very, very important. Unfortunately, while there are approximations, this is still not exact. With the basis sets, all these methods become worse and worse in terms of computational cost. So the cost increases, two reasons. One is the basis set. As the basis set becomes better and better, cost increases and, sorry, and with the method. So as the method improves from Hartree Fox CI to couple cluster, the computational cost increases. And I don't have to tell how it increases. For Hartree Fox, it is roughly n to the power three to four. For MP2, it is roughly n to the power five. For couple cluster, it is at a at a at a low level, singles and doubles, it is six, n to the power six, it can be n to the power seven, and so on. So you can imagine n is basically the size of the system, how quickly the computational cost increases. I, I hope all of you realize between n to the power four and n to the power seven, what's the difference? Three orders of magnitude is a huge difference. So let's say I have just n equal to 10 and whatever is a prefactor, if n equal to 10, then n to the power four to n to the power seven, the computer time will increase thousand times. 10 cubed. Same system, n is 10. I am just using, instead of Hartree Fock, I am doing couple cluster, singles, doubles, triples, and that's n to the seven, and this will become thousand times more computing time. Now that's a huge thing many students don't realize. If you do Hartree Fock, let's say it takes five minutes. On the same computer, you do couple cluster, singles, doubles, triples, it will continue to run and it will become five, and it's a 10 electron system, 10, 5,000 minutes. And now you can imagine what is 5,000 minutes, right? So it will almost go to 80 hours, which is more than three days. The job is still not over. Of course, your computer is a bad computer because anything that takes, that's where the prefactor is important. Anything to start with, if it takes five minutes per heart rate, it's a bad computer for a 10 electron system. That's a different matter. I'm just giving an example. So this is pretty bad. And this limits, because you could, you could argue that if this gives chemical accuracy, why do I need density functional theory? And that is exactly what I'm trying to come at. For a large systems, this kind of scaling is just not allowed. I mean, it's just not going to end. Okay, and, and that's essentially the problem. So if you go only from Hartree Fock to MP2, it is not so bad. It's one order of magnitude. It's not bad for n equal to 10. You can still afford to do that. But this is not still good enough. So what would end up over a cup of coffee would end up in MP2 over a French dinner. I hope you understand. So you can submit a job, go for a cup of coffee, come back, your job is over. The same job, if you do MP2, you have to go for a French dinner, which is almost three hours, right? And then come back, and then your job will be over. 
if you do couple cluster singles and doubles even singles and doubles you may have to go for a vacation for a week and come back so i think that is the problem of what we call scaling the scaling is very very bad for such methods and even though and this i am even talking of a reasonable basis set if a basis set is larger then then obviously n will increase so this n is not really number of electrons only it is it is a very complex thing i will not worry about it it depends on the basis set for the same system so if it becomes larger and larger basis set you are doing a more accurate calculation but but it is just blowing up so this is a is a, a perspective that i first want to present that the normal quantum chemistry methods solves schrodinger equation we have all seen a psi equal to e psi i can set up the hamiltonian and i will later tell how do you set up the hamiltonian and then you can calculate the wave function it has a born interpretation everything is very nice unfortunately no exact solution is possible so we have to make approximation so sum and substance is the approximation which can give chemically accurate result is hugely expensive it has a large scaling because of this n dependence if n is very large it's going to just blow up and and you just cannot do calculation let's say you do want to do 1000 atoms 1000 atoms in a meaningful basis set couple cluster is just not possible even with the parallel programs with the best of clusters you will be struggling to do that of course you can always say the better the computer you are better off and that's true so if you have a huge supercomputer better off and also i must tell you when you develop any of these methods there are programming strategies like i told you parallel computing there are there are jobs which can there are algorithms which can run parallel parts of the algorithm so many tricks are done so of course things are not as bad as it sounds but the point is that the scaling is always there and it's going to slow down and beyond a point even with the fast computers best of algorithms we cannot solve schrodinger equation so that's the message with which i i want to start the dft that for large enough systems the solution of schrodinger equation with meaningful accuracy and that is very very important which means i have to go to couple cluster right with meaningful accuracy is not possible and who you can ask your question you are unmute yes. you can ask the question who 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 is asking yeah and go chatterji okay yeah Anubhav. please yeah please ask <coughs> yes uh, uh, you were talking about these uh, approximate methods for larger systems uh, having larger amount of atoms or larger uh, yeah uh, yeah particles. yeah but yeah. when we don't know the number of particles like in case of nano clusters nano particles or yeah. mm. any nano materials we do not mm. know the number of atoms that yes. might be residing there yeah so which approximate method we should go for one minute one minute let me first tell you these these If methods that they are talking, available first. yeah the, no just one minute i'll come mm. to that later these methods that i am talking can be applied for even small systems okay so even for helium atom i can do couple cluster it is not that these are used only for larger systems as i'm going down this can be used for small systems the point that i'm trying to tell if the system is very large then doing a calculation which is very very accurate is much more difficult because of this dependence that i talked of this n dependence that i talked of because n is very large if n is very large you just cannot do it but i can do for small system that what the question that you are asking for nano materials if i don't know how many atoms are there right yes. i cannot even do the this yes. uh, a cycle d side because to do a cycle d side 
my Hamiltonian must be defined. To define my Hamiltonian, I must know the atoms. So the problem is not even defined. That means you don't know the system for which you're calculating. So obviously, if you don't know the system, so that's a different point. But I think your point was about the method. These methods are go in this accuracy as I'm writing and they become more and more costly. And this can be applied for any systems, small, medium, large. But clearly because of this problem for large systems, this is not even tenable. So that is what I'm trying to say, that although the web function based methods are very good, the solution of, with meaningful accuracy is simply not possible for large systems. So of course your nanomaterial is a very large system, so even though I don't know how many atoms are there, I cannot even apply. I can right away say that I cannot at least apply a psycho or psi. Any of these methods cannot be applied for so many atoms because the nanomaterials are many, many atoms, right? So I have to abandon this approach. So this approach of doing solving a psycho or psi accurately is very good for small, medium-sized molecules. So for organic chemistry, which has reasonably small molecules, uh, you may be able to solve a cycle piece. It's possible and get away. So very simple organic molecules, organic reactions, you may be able to do it. Thermochemistry or whatever. But for everything, I cannot do it. Professor Paul. Yes. Professor Paul. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful, I'm learning a lot actually, very exciting. Uh, so I have a naive, very naive questions. Yes. So a couple cluster, right? Yes. Uh, can it explain yes. the phenomenon like H3 does not exist, but O3 ozone does? Well, that can be explained uh, even without couple cluster, maybe without MP2. Even Please understand, perturbation? yeah, the, uh, even with perturbation theory, it might, you might be able to explain. To explain this why it does not exist in O3 does. Yeah, yeah you, ha you, you have to just do the calculations, right? So it gives a right. There is no binding. It. Yeah, it might get. I'm just saying the couple cluster, and this uh, is a question that I have heard many, many places, has right. nothing to do with the cluster of atom or molecule. Okay. I think this is a big confusion, so I want to tell you. Thank you. The couple cluster can be done for, a, for H2. It H can be done for water. It can be done for methane. It can be done for benzene. It can be done for naphthalene. <laughs> so couple cluster is like water a, a method, which can be done for any molecule. Couple cluster should not be confused with an atomic cluster or a molecular cluster. An atomic cluster or a molecular cluster is also a molecule, a system, so for which also a couple cluster is possible. The point that I'm trying to say, larger the system, more difficult it is to calculate. Yeah. Thank you. That is a take home message. So whether it's a, H3 is a very small system. Right, right. So of course you can do couple cluster. But okay. There's no problem. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's a very small system. But if I if I take a triad, a, a, a three-member fragment of a very large molecule, mm -hmm. then I may not be able to calculate. Okay. So so it depends on what is the system, how how many atoms are there overall. So the couple cluster will become very difficult to do. But but if you can do it, you will get meaningful chemical accuracy. That's the point that I'm trying to say. If you can do it, but it must be very very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, to your question, I must say that there may be, even for small molecules, problems where if you do perturbation theory or CI, results are not reliable, but with couple cluster, you may get correct result. But that has nothing to do with, because that system is atomic cluster for any system. Like if you do water, water, the water, water, dimer interaction energy that I was talking about. Water, hydrogen, fluoride, hydrogen bond. Even for that, people have to use couple cluster because they're very, very small numbers. If you use Hartree Fock, it is not good enough today. So people are doing lots of interaction energy like hydrogen bond, water, and HF, mm -hmm. right? HF dimer. So all these are very, very small interaction energy. So you need a couple of clusters. Good, thank so, you. Yeah, so, so I just, in summary, I should say the couple of cluster is not just for what you conventionally call cluster of atoms or cluster of molecules. It's a method, general method, which can be applied to any molecule. 
or any any set of atom or atoms okay all right so the point that i am trying to say for organic chemists it is often possible and many organic chemists are actually using this but even for organic chemists many times what is important is not just calculation of interaction energies not just knowing whether the product is lower than the reactant whether it is exothermic or endothermic that's not the only thing that the organic chemists want to know if it is simple organic molecule and you want to know organic reaction and you want to know if it is exothermic or endothermic it is possible to use couple cluster very accurate results you can get believe me you don't need any other method you don't need dft which i'm going to come at but but today's organic chemists are much more ambitious they want to look at a progress of a reaction that is a reactant i start a, a reactant as i said a plus b how does it go to ab so that's the progress the reaction of course may be very very complex and we know that in this progress we can get various quantities like activation energy the hill activation energy we can get other intermediates and they all are formed as the coordinates of a and b keep changing okay so the simple reaction of hydrogen hydrogen going to h2 was of course a very simple barrier there is no it is a very simple reaction so there are there are situation where i have this is the reactant and this is the product this exothermic reaction but as you know as i change the coordinates sorry as i change the coordinate systems this is my r i can go from here up and then go down this is a very standard thing and this is called the activation barrier right so all of you know this and this determines the chemical kinetics how quickly the reaction moves through the arrhenius equation right the the organic chemist would like to know this so to know this it is not enough to calculate the reactant energy and the product energy but it is important to calculate the energy at various points various points and plot this entire curve the curve can be more complex so i start here i come here through something like this so there may be various hills so as you can see i have a hill i have another hill then a small hill then then eventually come here the organic chemist should like to know everything as the reaction proceeds this is the reactant this is the product and i would like to know so with this i'll be able to find out all the intermediates and the activation barrier and this entire thing today is called reaction mechanism so many many of the organic chemists actually propose reaction mechanism experimentalists propose no it will go do this we should be able to understand by theory whether it is correct or not if you can do a very proper theory but again even for a small organic reaction there are so many parameters that you vary this is not only one dimension i have written in one dimension as i told you it's a multi dimensional surface so many parameters you can vary that even for that small reaction what was possible to do thermodynamics by couple cluster is no longer possible to calculate so many so i can't do n to the power 6 or n to the power 7 so many times and 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 eventually look at a reaction mechanism and that is where we need simplifications simplifications which take place in many ways if it is a reasonable size molecule like what we are discussing the simplification comes in the form of dft which is still quantum mechanics of some sort and i will i will tell that later tomorrow it is simply simplified dft for large systems so now we can do large systems and i will tell you how but there may be even larger system for what even dft is not possible like proteins polymers they are so large that even dft is not possible and in fact for them you have to resort to 
what is called the classical mechanics. So I don't even consider electrons. I consider only atoms and or a group of atoms which interact among themselves. So that therein lies the whole idea of multi-scale simulation. Simulation at different length scale. So this is the force field. This is the, uh, you can do uh, coarse graining and so on. So this is what, for example, somebody like Susmita is working and there are many others who work in our institute and many institutions simulation. So they can't even apply DFT. That's the problem. Otherwise they would have been happy to apply DFT. Their systems are so large. So, so please understand that the A psi go to E psi, which is basically a wave function based quantum mechanics. Then you have DFT, which is also quantum mechanics. So let me call question, it. Yes. Question by Bapa Bapa Goswami. Yes, please. So please ask. Yes, please. Yes, please ask. Bapa Ditya, please ask. Yes, sir. Yes. Like uh, during calculation of any like a bit louder. Please ask a bit louder. Yeah, yeah. During calculation of reaction mechanism, so is it yes. possible to get negative activation of the, of the transition state between two intermediates? Yeah, between two intermediates, one can go down, but the, the activation energy actually say reactant to from the lowest intermediate to the highest activated state. So that is the that is the, so what is the energy that is required to cross the hill? But there are there are activation energies which are almost zero, barrierless. So there are reactions which are barrierless, which are very, very fast. But the concept of negative activation energy is, is a concept that many people have been propagating. And, and uh, it is actually not very clear what exactly that is mean. But it is possible that one can go into an intermediate and get into a trap. And then you have to come out to the product directly to the product. So that is probably what you are mentioning, that you go down, but then you still require to give an energy to come out of the, come out to the product. But the ex overall energy is always going to be the thermodynamics. Yeah, right. So there will be some point energy has to be given, some point energy has to be released. Yeah. So that's what not very standard. Yeah. Tell me. Okay. What kind of thing, like negative activation energy is possible for like, just like a barrierless process, but in that case, both the intermediates might be of higher energy, right? The intermediates will be higher energy. What do you mean by intermediates will be higher energy? Like because two, two if between so so yeah between two intermediates. Yeah, let me see what you are talking here. Yeah. So uh, let me go back to a more complex. Yeah. So let's say that these are the two intermediate. This is one intermediate. This is one intermediate. Yeah. So, in, so what is the question? The question is that like this transient state can be negative from both the intermediates or. So, so are you saying that the curve is something like this? So, how, so if it is, if it comes directly from here to here, yeah, that then it is no longer an intermediate. This is no longer an intermediate. I directly come here. That's the only intermediate I have. Okay. So I think yeah, yeah. So if this is not there, yeah. Okay. Now the, your point is that I come here, I have to go up if it is a if it is an intermediate. If I continue to go downhill, then this is no longer an intermediate. I'm okay. still going downhill. Right? Okay. So I can go downhill like this and then come to the product. That is possible. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's that is I'm possible. Saying. That you go down and then come back to the product. That is possible. So this type of activation energy could be like impossible, right? Yes, because because you just go down and get you can get trapped. Because automatically it goes to a very stable state. Yeah. So obviously you, you, reaching the product would become very, very difficult in many such cases because they are trapped. But even in such cases, you can be trapped in an intermediate and the reaction will not proceed. The barrier is very hard. Yeah, so those are very specific questions. I, I, at this point, we will not worry. Uh, we will talk about that later. Those are very specific questions. Professor so Paul, time, time, yes, yeah. Yeah, look at here. Uh, I probably miss uh, one point. Yeah. Uh, so in approximate solution, we came to RT4, where we have seen that still some of the thing can be taken care of by perturbation theory, MP2, MP3. After RT4. After RT4. Yeah, after RT4, where 60% yeah, yes. of this thing, 2% yes, 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 can yes, be taken care. Yeah. 
Yes. And then uh, we came to configuration interaction and then couple cluster. So I just want to know this config configuration interaction. Uh, yes, so configuration interaction I did not mention much. It's not a very good method, I'll tell you later. Uh, but it is almost as accurate as perturbation theories. Okay, so a approximate, okay. of course, for everything that is exact. So I will tell you, uh, I should write here for the perturbation theory. If I do almost a very high order correction, let's say MP10, okay, it's almost exact. Similarly, for configuration interaction, if I do singles, doubles, triples, quadruples, etc., it is almost exact. But that's very, very expensive. You can't do. It. So normal calculations are MP2, MP3, etc. Configuration interaction, singles, doubles, couple cluster, singles, doubles, and so on. Or maximum triples. So here, this is much better than this or this. Okay. So these are really fine grade uh, questions, but each of these methods can potentially go to the exact. Hartree-Fock can never go to the exact. Okay. But okay. each of these uh, each of these methods which are approximate can be scaled to the exact limit. Okay. Question is, exact limits are always very difficult to reach. So within a reasonable approximation, how quickly I can get results? What is the computational time? Okay. That is the discussion. It's a I discussion versus cost, cost, yeah, cost versus accuracy. Yeah. So basically everywhere you take a decision, right? You want to yeah. buy a thing, what is the quality, how much is the money? So it's, a, it's the same discussion here, actually. And this is a little bit complicated, but, but I'm actually not giving a lecture on the uh, age cycle this. I'm supposed to give lecture on DFT. That's why I'm just kind of covering up, but there are lots of discussion here. And my course in advanced quantum chemistry is precisely on, on, on discussion of uh, these methods. Yes, now tell me another method, an another question, yeah. Uh, okay, Professor Paul, so you said uh, small organic molecule to medium. So by yeah. medium, uh, you well, mean... Uh, yeah. Medium so what... is redefined, <laughs> depending uh, on the computer. Okay, so medium means, uh, do you think that uh, maybe polyaromatics like... 40, uh, like... 40 50 atoms. Okay, 40, 50 atoms. Yeah, 50 to 60 atoms. Okay. And if you have a transition metal, then I have to scale it down. So, okay. of course, you know, it depends. I'm looking at organic molecule, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, etc. Okay. So, yeah, 50 to 60 is no problem today. As I told you, this has been continuously scaled down. Scaled down. Because better computers are coming. Okay. Okay. Uh, the programs are becoming more sophisticated. So all that is uh, making our ambition level is higher. And, you know, God knows at someday Susmita's problem for protein may be solved by a couple clusters. So classical simulation will no longer be required then. So that will give exact result, almost near exact result. Okay, if I have that big a, big a computer. But I don't see that happen, happen in the near future, right? So, okay. you know, it's just not possible. Of course, people are now using artificial intelligence and machine learning. I didn't want to talk about that. So that, they are also making things better. So there are tremendous uh, uh, improvement that is happening. But be that as it may, the DFT has come out as, uh, as an approximate quantum mechanics, much more uh, a method which is uh, much more attractive, I should say. Okay. Okay, got it. So, so I was talking of the multi-scale simulation. So these are the different level of quantum mechanics. Some people used to use semi-empirical like CNDO, MNDO, etc. That's also quantum mechanics. But then you have this force field simulation for classical mechanics, which is called atomistic simulation. Then you have coarse grain simulation for polymers and even larger systems. And eventually it goes on to the bulk and engineering simulation. So all that together is today called the, the, the multi-scale simulation. What I'm, of course, you know, it's impossible to cover all that. What I'm really interested in is just DFT. Why? Because for one, it is a quantum mechanics. Second, it is reasonably accurate, not as good as CCSD, couple clusters. But it is better than the Hartree form. Computer time, it is almost near hard reform. So I now write down why DFT. So one is that this is a method which scales 
as nearly as Hartree-Fock map. So you can see once it scales at Hartree-Fock, it is reasonable, very good scaling. This is the best we could do in the solution of A psi equal to E psi. So computing, so CPU scales as Hartree-Fock. Yet, it is more accurate than Hartree-Fock. Not very rigorous, of course. That is this problem. So I cannot definitely predict how accurate it will be. But it is certainly more accurate than Hartree-Fock. And what is most important is that it scales as Hartree-Fock. So I can now apply DFT for reasonable size molecule, which is not possible. For reasonably large molecule, organic, inorganic, whatever. People are doing transition metal and so on. Also, although I, my concentration will be more on organic molecules, but you can do inorganic also. So people are today doing DFT. I know people have done 1,000 atoms, which is just not possible for couple cluster. You can do Hartree Fock with 1,000 atoms. But what is the difference? In Hartree Fock, your results are not accurate. So DFT, it is better than Hartree Fock. So these two things are very, very important. It scales as Hartree Fock, but yet it's better than Hartree Fock. Though not very rigorous, and I'm going to qualify this part later. That's, that's the problem with DFT. But at least for a reasonably large molecule, like even 1,000 atoms, so the parallel computing today, you should be able to DFT, which is, which is reasonably accurate. And very often, its accuracy is of the order of perturbation, at least. Even better than MP2, maybe MP3. It's configuration interaction singles doubles. Not as good as couple cluster, but doesn't matter. I have done the job with a scaling which is as good as Hartree Fock. So it is really a very good compromise. An excellent compromise. Compromise to cost and accuracy. So what I've done today, and I'll end here because it's getting close to eight o'clock. I don't think I should keep you here. What I've done today is to set the stage for DFT. Because there are a lot of discussion. So there is a group of quantum mechanics people who do a cycle to side. We fondly call them ab initio. It's a Latin word. It means from the beginning. And then the DFT, DFT people sometimes also like to call themselves ab initioist, though this group does not accept them as ab initio. So there is, there is a lot of, you can say, religious fights between ab initio and DFT. Because ab initio solves Schrodinger equation, DFT does not solve Schrodinger equation. And that is something where I'll start, does not solve the Schrodinger equation. So DFT does not have psi, it does not get psi. If DFT does not get psi, it does not, you will not be able to calculate the probability density as you might wonder. But that is where DFT will score. It will still be able to calculate probability density directly without calculating psi. And that is where of course the name density is borrowed. But since we don't get the entire psi, we don't get the Schrodinger equation solved, the, the ab initio people who actually write A psi equal to B psi solve at different level does not accept DFT as an ab initio method. But remember, both are quantum mechanics. So both are threaded together by quantum mechanics. The people who do force field simulation for proteins, peptides, for polymers, large peptides and macromolecules and so on, or coarse graining, they are not doing quantum mechanics. So plus understand this. They are actually using classical mechanics. They don't have Hamiltonian. They have nothing. 
they have only atoms which directly classically interact. So there is no semblance of quantum mechanics. Here, both of them are quantum mechanics. Yet, there is a difference in approach. One group calculates psi, one does not calculate psi. In a very minimalistic way, I can tell the difference. That makes DFT as accurate, as uh, cheap as the Hartree Fock within the Abinitio. So, within Abinitio, there is a Hartree Fock, I told you, HF, which is cheap, but bad. So, when I say Abinitio, I don't mean exact. And that is very, very important to understand. Abinitio simply means from the beginning. So, you have Hartree Fock. You have perturbation, you have CI, you have couple clusters. So graded accuracy is becoming more and more accurate. Many people consider that you are solving H cycle D psi, hence it is exact. It is not. First of all, each of them also works under a basis set. I already told you. So that is anyway not exact, the basis. I will tell you what how, how does the basis set derive later. So they are not exact, but they are from the beginning, which means no parameters from experiment are used. So everything is what I now, physicists have a different name, they call it first principle. But the name of the physicist, first principle, is something that I don't use. Because physicists use that for DFT as well. DFT, unfortunately, is quantum mechanics, but uses parameters. So this, to me, is not really a first principle method, where no recourse to experiment is taken. Here, no recourse to experiment is taken. DFT, recourse to experiments are taken. Recourse to parameters are taken. So that is a very major religious difference. So many people who are working on couple cluster have never transited to DFT. In fact, they dislike. Although they're intelligent enough to understand DFT. That has not been the problem, but it's a philosophical problem. So All my yes, I yeah, I will close it now. Yeah, no, yes. To, uh, to understand the properties of supramolecular aggregates, right? Yes, yes. So you think coarse then be better than DFT, right? Depends on how large. How large? Okay. Then the so so that's what I'm saying. Today, even 500, 600 atoms, you can do DFT. Mm -hmm. And of course, what computer you have? So these are answer. There is no ready answer for this. I told you a day will come when protein also we can do by a couple of us. But My suddenly DFT. Liposomes, the properties of those can also be predicted, right? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. So if you have big enough computer, 500 atoms is not a problem to do a DFT. Okay. okay. So what I'm saying is that many people have not transited because they philosophically didn't want to transit. But I did. I was also in the Abini show couple clusters. So when I first gave a DFT application, whatever talk, there are a lot of people, they said, oh, you too. The very famous statement that you too ditched the Abin issue of people, right? I mean, you too transited to DFT. They didn't like it. <laughs> they said, I mean, you, you have also become impure in some way. But, but today, you know, this was a discussion long, long back. Today, that's not true. Because both are shredded together to quantum chemistry. There is a lot of give and take between the DFT and this, and I will come to that. There are functionals which are hybrid and so on and so forth. So the entire scenario has changed. And, and that is the reason today I'm here to give a talk on DFT. You know, I wouldn't have done that 30 years back. All right. And DFT has also made spectacular progress. So with this stage being said, I think in the next class, I will start on DFT. And as I told you, I will first define what is DFT, how does it not use psi, how does it still have density? 
So that is, those are the things that I'm going to first define. Let me also tell you that DFT is called, of course, density functional theory. So I will have to define what is a density, what is a functional for the students. Now the, the mathematics part will be very little. I mean, this is all about it. And we will go directly how you do DFT. And the important part in the DFT is a functional, you will realize. And of course, just like H psi or B psi, basis set. If nothing is sacrosanct in quantum mechanics without a basis set. So everything has a basis set, and this is makes everything impure. So what I'm going to do, and that was a very specific request from Shubhajit, that I must address what is basis set, like 631G, 631G star, etc. Et cetera. I will do that. Believe me, I will do that. Uh, but I want to stay the set for the theory first. Every theory that I'm discussing in quantum mechanics works under the basis set. It has nothing to do with couple cluster, Hartree. Basis set is common everywhere. So I will, of course, do the basis set at, at some point of time. So, so I will first start with the density functional theory, very primitive without much of mathematics, and then come to the grassroots problem, how, what functional we use. And you will see that there is a zoo of functionals. I hope you understand what I mean. There is a zoo of functionals. So like, you know, if you go to a zoo, you see so many animals, right? So you will see so many functionals. And you must have already seen those you use, oh, B3 leaf, uh, BP91, PW91, BP80, whatever, I mean, it can have. As I'm talking, new functionals have been developed. So just amazing zoo. So what kind of functional is good? So just like here, I have methods, graded method. DFT also has graded method depending on functionals. But the number here is much more than this. The number of variations in functional is much more and that really is a confusing thing. Each of these two sets of methods works under a basis set. So basis set will be a very common thing. So I will see if I'm going to discuss basis set first or the functional first, but let me on the next class first put the density functional theory. And now that you know why am I doing density functional theory, despite tremendous progress in solution of H psi equal B psi, I think that should be very clear that it is for the computational cost. I am interested in large molecules and large molecules, are particularly if I want to do reaction mechanism, where I want to find out all possible geometry, intermediate, transition states, and so on, it's very hard to do. So that is the reason organic chemists, even though their molecules are small, do not use H psi equal T psi, but they conveniently use DFT. So I think that is very important first to understand why DFT, because it's a small enough molecule, you can do couple cluster, but because you want the entire surface, you have to do so many calculations that we move to DFT. So, Professor Paul, the next okay, class with that, I will class. 630. Yeah, 630 tomorrow. Okay. So, I'm going to end the class today. Okay. Uh, today, unfortunately, yeah, it didn't become one and a half hour. I was thinking because we started about 15 minutes. Yeah, late. Late, yeah. So, I have still not taken one and a half hour. Initially, intended to 630 to 8, yeah. but I think 8 is already a lot. Mm -hmm. So, I, I would say that I would stop here. There is no reason for me. I don't have a syllabus. So I don't have to end the syllabus. Yeah, yeah. So I have no problem. I have no problem. So I can uh, very easily go as slow as possible. Okay. So I, with this, I think if you have any more questions, you can ask. If there are any more questions, I have come here. So you can ask me directly. Otherwise, we'll go tomorrow directly. Sir, I have that, yeah. Yeah. So, so during like you have so you have uh, talked about the potential energy surface and local minima and global minima. So yes. for during optimization of any chemical organic chemical structure or any chemical structure, inorganic chemical structure. Yeah. So, yeah. so is there any is there uh, any way to say like if it reaches the global minima or local minima or how to define? Yes, of course, of course, of course. Mathematically people can reach, but it is very hard to reach. So by looking yeah, at but it's not possible, right? Looking at this uh, surface, it is possible, but you, can, you, can you predict that you have actually traversed the entire surface? That itself is very difficult. 
Okay. Because I, I plotted a curve as a one dimensional, but it is not one dimensional, it's a multi dimensional. And you have to change, you have to actually scan all possible ways of changing the atoms. Right? Yeah. So there are so many reaction mechanisms that is possible, as you know, in the experiment. Yeah. So just like in theory, you have to scan all possibilities where it will attack, how it will move. And that is very difficult to say that you have done. So even for geometry optimization, when you are talking of global minimum, that's also a very difficult problem to say that there is a global minimum because you have to be very sure that you have scanned every surface. So while theoretically it is possible, mathematically it is possible, people know the theory how to get global minimum versus local minimum is very often uh, very difficult to apply. Okay, and and most of the most of the theories which are based on gradient and Hessian actually give you a local minimum. Okay, so it's very hard mathematically uh, to program the global minimum. Okay, so you are never sure. So what people do is to try again to another thing. So what you are talking of geometry optimization and reaction mechanism have very similar problems. That is, you have to scan all possibilities. For reaction mechanism also, you are not sure that this mechanism is right. So people come up in theory with a mechanism which experimentalists don't agree. Because they will say that it is not possible to do okay. some, some mechanism. Sometimes you may come up with a very good mechanism hmm. or you may miss, or conversely, you may miss a mechanism which experimentalists think that that is correct. Right. So reaction proceeds, theory says it should not have proceeded. Because you have not scanned everything. You understand yeah. so those are yeah those are definitely uh, problem problems with actually doing the calculations okay. yes any other okay. question yes uh, one more sir sorry sir so that yeah. the, the, the during calculation of interaction energy so basically yeah. it's like product like reactant minus product or product minus reactant so i'm yeah. asking like uh, what type of energies need to be count like the electronic energies only or the no 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 i think yeah yeah that those are very different problems if you want to only look at enthalpy difference, you should be able to calculate just the enthalpy, like exothermic, endothermic. But if you want to know the spontaneity of the reaction, then you have to do free energy. Like so that's thermodynamics. Uh, you have to calculate the free energy. Yeah. Okay, I have to calculate the free energy. I have to take, take yeah. account the correct free energy correction. I have to take it take into account. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that is better because then you have to take entropy effect. There are ways of doing it. So it depends on what you want to do. If you want to just know that zero Kelvin, what is free energy enthalpy is good enough. Okay. okay. So, okay. yeah. So, so basically what you do is a free energy. Yeah. I mean, because you want to have the temperature effect, which does not come in enthalpy. Right. So electronic energy is one part. After that, I will tell it into next to tomorrow, we add a nuclear, nuclear potential energy to get what is potential energy surface. And then we, uh, we can, we can get the enthalpy basically. And then you have to do temperature and entropy correction to get free energy. Okay? Because G is H minus T S, right? I mean, that's the thermodynamics. Yes, yes. Okay. yes Krishnandu Kole. You want to ask some question? Uh, I'm Devashish. Uh, oh, Devashish Kole. Oh, somehow I saw Krishnandu Kole. No, it's okay, my, anyway. son's, my son's Zoom. It's my oh, son's okay, Zoom. Okay. Fine, fine, fine. So you I, want I, to I ask was... any? Question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sir. And this is a comment. It is wonderful, sir. Uh, yeah, we have also learned a lot here on this part. And uh, this one thing also, there is uh, the opposite. So in, in many cases, the calculations give a lot of hint to the experimental findings. Yes, basically. yes. So yes. this, uh, even uh, ab initio or DFT results, uh, very nitty gritty calculations can help the experiments to do certain reactions so as yes. to find out whether uh, we can reach a different pathway or we can yes. explore right. other possibilities. Right. So that's so also, I think, I, yeah, I think that is true. We will two headed arrows, arrows, basically. Yeah, we will discuss that later. Right now, we are just discussing the method. So yeah. I will come back and discuss those things later. Because a lot of things can be done. And today, what Devasis is telling that you can use as a predictive uh, method, computation as a prediction to reaction, design molecule, design reactions, catalysis, for example. Design of catalysis has been tremendously enabled by computation. Artificial intelligence, machine learning. So lots of things have happened, you know. We will, I will summarize that later. But yes, yeah, thank you for pointing out the verses. 
thank you sir thank you sir yes i think we should close thank you yeah. i think we'll close it if there are no yeah. more questions so let us thank you sir for a very late nice yeah. lecture so and we yeah, will meet tomorrow yeah we'll meet tomorrow yeah. Thank please, you. please make sure that the recording there is no problem tomorrow. You get it. Yeah. So yeah. I will check it yeah, again. So and if you need, yeah, yeah, you need it. And yeah, it unfortunately, yeah. And please try to come in time. You know, tell all of them to come in time okay. so that we don't lose yeah. time. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm leaving. Yeah. Okay. okay. Bye.